voice of the drum calls. It sings a song of those who came before us and those to come. A song of survival and strength. A song of participation and voice. A song that calls us together. When we come together and participate in the 2010 census, we use this tool as the voice of all our native people. Our voice, it is in our hands. 2010 census. Hello, I'm Camelia Costa. Welcome to the Native News Update on Monday, April 19th. Many of the stories you hear here can be found at our website, IndianCountryNews.com. And here's the news for the day from the Associated Press and other Native News sources. One player racks up points by defeating Native American tribal leaders, the other by snuffing out settlement of an English colonist. Capture Boston or Plymouth Colony and victory is yours. That's the gist of King Philip's War, a board game based on a bloody and violent clash of the same name between colonists and Indian tribes in 17th century New England and developed by a company partly owned by the former major league picture, Kurt Schelling. The game's designer says he hopes to educate children and others about a war that cost thousands of lives but received scant attention in history books. But some Native Americans want the game blocked from release, saying that it trivializes the conflict and insensitively perpetuates a stereotype of Indian tribes as savages. Dozens of tribal members protested the game in province last month and a Facebook group with more than 260 members urge Multiman Publishing to halt production. But Schilling says historical events should not be whitewashed for fear of offending someone. King Philip's war helped forge early American identity, even if it clearly exposed the horrible side of humans in some cases, he said. As the trial for Richard Marshall, Marshall continues, we go to Paul Domain for the latest update. Hey, Paul, can you give us an, uh, another update on the Richard Marshall trial? Uh, thanks, Kim. Yes, we're in Rapid City, South Dakota, where Arlo, uh, excuse me, uh, Richard Dick Marshall's trial reopened this morning in the federal courthouse, and uh, we're following up from last week. The last witness there was Arlo Looking Cloud, who tested on Thursday, uh, testified on Thursday and all day uh, Friday and Friday afternoon, where we left off with this last report. He was being cross-examined. And, of course, the defense attorney was trying to impeach his credibility, trying to make him admit that somehow the federal government had made some kind of a deal with him in which he would change his testimony, where upon he began telling people and the federal government that Dick Marshall had given the gun to Theta Nelson Clark when uh, John Boy Graham, Theta Nelson Clark, Arlo Looking Cloud with anime in the back of the Red Pinto was brought to Allen, South Dakota, uh, to the Dick Marshall residence and Cleo Gates residence in December of 1975, uh, maybe perhaps an hour to two hours before she was executed. Arlo Looking Cloud has testified that that's where he received the gun. The defense is trying to claim that Arlo has changed his story and they attempted to impeach him. Uh, they didn't. Uh, they didn't get that out of him. They didn't break him down. Uh, he comes in with a conviction behind him and several reasons to want to be motivated. And so that led to this morning's hearing in which his attorney, attorney Barry Bacharach, testified that uh, that um, change in Arlo Looking Cloud's testimony began sometime in 2008. Now, there were some restrictions on his testimony, but I had a talk to Attorney Bacharach earlier, and he indicated to me that it was some four to six months previous to his debriefing by the federal government that our little looking cloud began talking to him about the issue of Dick Marshall giving the trio the gun, and that he was afraid of Dick Marshall and uh, Charlie Aberask and the AIM leadership here, not only to his personal safety, but to the safety of his family here on the Pine Ridge Reservation, which prevented him from coming forward all these years. The interesting thing that I observed is, is that our little looking cloud didn't just say they didn't get the gun. He said that he never went to Dick Marshall's for many, many years. Now, you want to think about this. Dick Marshall is not contesting that Arlo came to his house that evening, even though Arlo for years said that he never was there. 
Uh, so I find that interesting that it's not simply that Arlo began saying, I went to Dick Marshall's house. He, he never said any of that until around 2007, 2008, when he began working with his attorney. So um, they tried to, uh, again, they tr the intent of the defense was to try to say that there is some kind of a deal with the government. And out of that, Bacharach admitted that sometime in the future, they might be able to call on the govern a government, depending on what Arlo Looking Cloud says and does, to ask them for a letter saying he essentially has begun to cooperate or has cooperated, that there could be a positive letter sometime in the future for parole or for reconsideration, but it's not a given. Uh, later on, they brought in, uh, they, they did some technical things having to do with uh, uh, jurisdiction on the reservation, the enrollment of Dick Marshall. Uh, but then they brought in uh, Robert Ekefe, who is now into the forensics and the history of the case. When he became U.S. Marshal in 1994, reopened the case up, uh, then uh, began asking questions that he indicated that it was Gladys, Gladys Bizonet in 1994 that approached him and said that if he wanted to find out more information about what happened to the anime pig to Aquash and who was uh, responsible for a murder, that she needed to talk to a, a uh, individual by the name of Al Gates in Denver, Colorado. And that began uh, the participation of a detective by the name of Abe Alonzo, who we're expecting to hear uh, later on today or tomorrow, uh, in which Abe Alonzo began investigating this case out of Denver, Colorado, and looking at the Troyland Yellowwood connection, Arlo Looking Cloud connection, Angie Begay Janice connection and John Boy Patton Graham connection. Um, and his stuff is mainly uh, technical, uh, a look at the forensic information which they discover uh, ligature marks. They showed pictures this morning which indicated that there was ligature markings on uh, the wrist of, uh, uh, of anime pick to aquash indicating that she had been uh, tied up. Uh, that uh, she was found that the weather had preserved her body, but she was very uh, dehydrated, and, and there was pictures of that. It was difficult for Denise Pictou, who was in the courtroom, to review those. Uh, he then went into getting the information about the issue of a note that said, uh, take care of this baggage. Now, Cleo Gates testified two days ago that it didn't say baggage, but it says, take care of this luggage. Who's and there was the note? Pardon me? Where did the note come from? Well, we're not sure. The note was uh, allegedly given to uh, Dick Marshall by Theda Nelson Clark. Uh, Dick Marshall handed it to John Graham, who handed it to Arlo, who handed it back to Theda. But it was delivered there by Theda Nelson Clark, and it allegedly said, take care of this baggage. Cleo Gates the other day testified that she said it was take care of this luggage. Uh, you know, they showed up at midnight at Dick Marshall's and had a suitcase they wanted him to get rid of or something uh, is what. Uh, they're arguing about the language, get rid of this baggage, get rid of this luggage. And the question is, is that the evidence that the note doesn't exist now. So basically, they've got to take it from people's uh, remembrances and, and where they heard from that. And the defense is trying to prevent that word baggage from getting into it. Uh, also, that uh, some of the information that... Marshall Ekafi got at that time came from Arlene Choch Goings, also known as uh, Choch Means, uh, in which that got uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ekafi to uh, interview Dick Marshall himself and Cleo Gates herself about this case. And so uh, uh, when, when, uh, Dick, uh, when uh, excuse me, when Robert Ekafi testified, he claimed that when uh, Dick Marshall was talking to him. He said that when the trio came to his door, uh, he knew who Anime was because he knew her from Wounded Knee, even though he has denied from time to time I've ever seen her ever before or having anything to do with her. Uh, Ekafi testified that Marshall said he knew her from Wounded Knee in 1973. Uh, now, there's going to be more discussion about the types of guns in forensics, but uh, basically... Uh, Robert Ekefe was done testifying this morning, and they now have uh, Kamuk Ekefe on it, also known as Darlene Ekefe, and formerly as Kamuk Banks, Dennis Banks's ex-wife, who testified uh, this morning about her relation with the, uh, relationship with the American Indian Movement and uh, her relationship with Dennis Banks, how she got involved, how she observed 
the fact that when they went to Farmington, New Mexico, Leonard Peltier, she heard that Leonard Peltier had put a gun to Anna May's uh, head and interrogated her about being an informant, that she was at the Bavarian Inn in Custer, South Dakota, when Leonard Crow Dog confronted uh, Anna May and basically came to her and Dennis and said, uh, Anna May is a uh, FBI informant. I've kicked her off the property. She's here now, uh, causing another uh, kind of uh, a situation in which it was clear that people in the American Indian Movement were considering Anna May an informant. And uh, we're waiting for author Cyril Chapman to come on either this afternoon or later this morning, and Richard Two Elk and Matheline White Bear as well. Well, thanks for the update, and we'll look forward to hearing more That's tomorrow. the latest roundup of news from Indian Country on this edition of the Native News Update. I'd like to thank you for joining me, and have a grand day.